Hey, we're back, and um, we are continuing in chapter one um, in our strengths book, which is so exciting. And we, on our last lecture, we looked at the normal stress that came about because of an axial load. And today we're going to look at shear stress, which comes about because of axial load. So this is going to be a lot like bolted connections or glued connections. Um, and so it's an axial load applied to the system, but it becomes a shear force, shear, which becomes a shear stress because we are going to be looking at a force parallel to a plane. So just a brief review. Um, yesterday or the last video we talked about, you know, what is stress? It's just a force over an area. That's our units force over area. And we looked at normal, normal stress. So remember normal just means perpendicular to my cross section. So I can have an axial force like I could on this rubber band. Okay. It's causing some deformation, but it's actually that normal force is acting perpendicular to that cross section of the rubber band. Well, I could have a normal force. And if I had a bolted connection that was taking this rubber band, pretend it's like a, a, a plate, okay, and I have a bolt in there. So as I'm pulling, okay, as I'm pulling with a normal axial load and we cut this to look at that inter, in internal force, we're going to see it's a shear force. It becomes a shear force because it's going to be parallel to the cross section of our bolt. So remember, normal just means perpendicular to the cross section. Shear just means tangent or parallel to the plane. It's like cutting bread, okay? And again, we it's the same units. It's still stress. It's still force over area. It's a Pascal, which is a Newton per meter squared, or it's KSI or PSI. So watch your units. A lot of times the units will direct you on what it is you need, how you need to set up your equation, because all we have right now is stress and force and area, okay? So just keep that in mind. So when we apply that normal force, that axial load, so we're specifically the axial load. When I cut the inside of that plate, I can see the picture of that plate. Um, I can see that if I cut this left side over here, right over here, see that left side? Okay. If I were to cut that and find that internal normal force that's associated with that 75 kips, I would find internal equal and opposite. I would have a normal force of 75 kips. Um, if P is 75, then I know P over 2 is 37.5. Um, if I were to cut the plates on the right, okay, I'm pulling at 37.5. I could say, okay, that's a plate that's a, a 1 inch by 10 inch plate. I now have a cross-sectional area, and I could calculate the normal force. And again, that normal force is going to be causing a tension or compression. Well, how, how, if I'm pulling to the right, 75 to the left, 75, we're in equilibrium, okay? Those shear pins in there, okay, so they could be bolts, they could be screwed in, they could be dowel rods, um, are going to be wanting to be sliced in half. Like if we had failure at the bolts, it'd be going, brink, okay, right across there. So we have an axial load, and we talked about the internal normal stress yesterday. Well, as we're pulling that, if we have a bolted connection, we have that normal axial, okay, normal force. It's normal. It's perpendicular to the cross section. That's how we're applying it. But as it goes across that bolt, it's now a parallel to the cross section force. So it's a shear force caused by a normal or axial load. Okay. It's a shear force caused by a normal or axial load versus a shear force we're going to get from torsion and a shear force we're going to get from beams and bending. Okay. So this is specifically shear force caused by an axial load, okay? So again, if our shear force, if we have a force, we have a stress, if stress is force over area, then I can use statics equilibrium. I can calculate the shear force that's going across that interface, okay, that cross section of the bolt. If I know the cross section of the bolt, I now know the shear stress. Or if I know the material and I know the allowable stress, right? And I know the force because I've got statics on my side, I can calculate what diameter bolt do I need? What diameter dowel rod do I need? If it's a glue, okay, if I have adhesive on there, it's going to have an area that's glued together, right? An area that's glued together. What is that area of contact that's glued together? I can calculate how much square area of glue that I need, okay? So that's what's really cool. And then in our next video, we're going to talk, you know, there's more things that could, that could go on here. Like I could have, if I have these dowel rods in there and these plates are somewhat soft, I could cause a bearing stress, which, which, which would cause those holes to get a little bit bigger. 
then I have wiggle room and I might not want to have wiggle room in that connection, okay? Um, I could actually cause the whole back end of the plate to shear out, like the bolts would shear through the plate. And we call it shearing through the plate, but it would be, you know, it, it would it, that would be a shear force because of, of the area that's being sheared. And so we're going to play around with in the next video different, the way different areas look. And and how do I figure out the area? And once I get my area, is it a normal or shear? Normal, shear. Okay, you just have to look at the direction of the load. Okay, so if I go back and we, we looked at these slides yesterday, but we looked at them with the internal force. If I look at this internal force, um, or the external force rather, I can again see it's perpendicular to the cross section. It's along that longitudinal axis. It acts through the centroid. It's an axial load. And yesterday we looked at P over A or N over A, okay, the force that's in that wood member. And now we're looking at the bolted connection. So as that force is traveling up through my connection, okay, as it's traveling up, it has to cross, if you want to look at it, cross that bolted area. And we don't want that bolt to shear. Like I don't want that bolt to just cut in half, right? Like I'm slicing bread because that's what the shear force is like slicing the bread. Um, and so we have to have a resisting force that's acting across the cross section of that bolt to keep the bolt from shearing. So again, what is statics? It's equilibrium. It's our good friend equilibrium. If I have a force P that's going through the axial load, I have to have a shear force equal and opposite acting across that bolted connection. So what is my stress? It is that internal resisting shear force that came from the axial load divided by the cross-sectional area. Um, and again, we're going to assume an average. So every point on this uh, cross section has the same amount of shear stress, shear resistance, you know, um, if I had two bolts, I'd have double the area. If I had four bolts, quadruple or triple, whatever, quadruple the area. So the area is, you know, not necessarily just one bolt, but if I had a four bolted connection there, I would have four times the area. Okay, so I want you to look up in the right hand corner now. So we have shear average equals V over A. So shear stress, we call a tau. Shear stress will always be a tau. Our normal stress was sigma. Our shear stress is always tau. So when you look at material properties in a book and you want to find out, well, what's my yield stress or what's my ultimate or, you know, what am I allowed? You have to first identify, am I looking at a normal stress or a shear stress? Because materials are going to have a different value for the normal stress than they would the shear stress. And you don't want to pull the wrong one out of the book. Okay? You don't want to way over design it and lose money. And you don't want to under design it and have, a, a, have an issue. So you have to start understanding normal stress is always going to be the sigma. Shear stress is always going to be a tau. Okay. So as we come through, where might we see a sheared connections? Okay, I think of shear again as cutting that bread. If I have a fresh loaf of bread and I take a knife and I cut, 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 we are literally it's like putting butter on that bread. Putting butter on the bread is a shear force. It is parallel to the bread versus, I guess, putting a string through the bread. I don't, I don't even know, but shear force is that putting the butter on the bread. It's the shear, shear. It's cutting the bread. And when we look at shear strain, we're going to see that when we cut that bread, it kind of divots in like this. So again, that normal stress, we're going to have a lengthening or a shortening. When we look at shear deformation, we're going to see it's a kind of a change of an angle. So where could we see things like this? Well, definitely anytime we have like a cotter pin, um, a bolty connection, dowels, we're pulling across, we're going to have a resisting shear force in that cross section of the pin or pins. Um, we could look at uh, if you if you are a mechanical person um, and you know how they make uh, like punches or even if you just punch holes in your paper because you like to put them in your notebook. When you punch that paper, that little punch that goes through the paper, it's actually a shear force. It's shearing through the paper and the area that we're shearing is the circumference times the thickness of the paper. If I have a punch. Okay, if I have a mechanical punch and I'm punching out holes in a plate, okay, because I need to put bolts through that plate, so I have to maybe mechanically punch out. Um, or think about your belt. Okay, if you have a belt and you have a belt buckle, you have the different holes depending on the size of your waist. How do you think those poles, those holes got there? You had a solid piece of leather and you punched through. So that punch 
Okay, it's this is look, I'm perpendicular to my cross section, punching through that resisting area is going to be the circumference, okay, times the thickness. And it's a shear area because it's the, the force is now parallel to the inside of that cut. So it's kind of cool. And um, we could have, um, you can see that with the step there. So again, it, it's just, shear just means it's a force parallel to the surface versus perpendicular, okay? So single shear. Single shear would mean if we had one bolt and it was in single shear, we would be cut, trying to cut through just one, one part of the cross section. So if I had if I if I had my pencil is a bolt and I'm putting it through my my bolt space, okay, and then I had another plate coming this way, we would just see that one cross sectional area, like you can see on the steel plate the steel plate and the support. Um, if you are looking at something that spins with gears, you might have a shear key, um, and that shear key as this as this wants to spin, that shear key right there. Um, you can see it's it's going to want to slice through the middle of it, through the middle of it like bread. So the cross-sectional area is going to be the depth times the length that you can see, okay? That's going to be what gets sheared. And in this case, it would be a single shear, okay? Um, so a single shear, if I were to cut that bolt or that dowel rod in half in shear, it's going to end up with two pieces, single shear. So one, one times the area. Shear stress equals V over A. Okay, we could have double shear. What does double shear mean? It would be like a chain, like a link. If I were to pull like two a chains that were, you know, that, that were together like this and pull across, it has to shear now through two areas, the area above and the area below. So uh, we might call it a double pinned connection in a problem statement. We might just say, hey, this is double pinned, this is single pinned. All it means is, is our area. And you can see this nice side view from, from this example on the right. Um, you can see that pin that goes through. If I were to pull um, member BCD out of that connection, it would have to shear through two sections of that bolt area. So in this case, the shear stress would be V over 2A because I have double the area. So by increasing that to a double shear, we've increased the capacity. We've doubled the capacity by introducing. Ah, uh, now we have to shear through two, okay? So it's a great way. So if I wanted to look at a double shear failure, or uh, it, it would look like I now have three parts, okay? Because I have two sets of area that I'm having to cut through in order for a failure to occur, okay? So the other thing to keep in mind is in statics. We tend to find our reactions at C. I can see it's a pinned connection. It even tells me it's a pinned connection, then double pin. Um, we tend to find the X and Y components. Well, the magnitude is the force I'm concerned with because the magnitude is going to be the long end of the triangle vector. It's it's the actual force I'm resisting. I'm not pulling to the right and up. I am pulling directionally right and up. And so when you find a pinned connection like here, CX and CY, you have to find the magnitude of C, which is CX squared plus CY squared. Take the square root. Use Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Use the magnitude of CX and CY to actually calculate the shear force that is on uh, that pin. So additional areas. Um, if I look at this first, this first, whoops, we're going to go back. If I look over here and I'm in torsion, if I have two collars, the, the collars are bolted together with four bolts. As I'm twisting, it's going to cause a shear across the face of those bolts. I can see that I have four bolts. So the resisting area is four times the area of one bolt. Okay. This is the example of a punch and getting a slug or, you know, putting a hole in your belt. Okay. Putting a hole in your, in your leather belt, if you need to punch a hole in there. And so, you know, I'm, I'm pushing, I'm pushing the punch down or even a, a hole punch on a, on a, a that you put your paper in, you know, a paper punch. It's doing the same thing, except it's really, really thin. When you look at the height. And so the shear area, when we look at this, it has to be that outer perimeter, that circumference times thickness of the slug. That's what's being sheared. And so, you know, what's interesting to think about is, is as I'm pushing down on this punch, what happens if the material of my punch is very, like, soft and malleable compared to that of my slug? 
well, I probably am going to have a compression failure of my punch before I can punch anything through the paper. If you put too much paper in a three-hole punch, can you punch through it? No, you end up boogering the whole thing up. It gets stuck in the paper and you have to take it apart. So when you're designing things, you have to think about, okay, how is this force going from here to here? Where could I have failures all along the way? We could also, in this case, maybe where this plate is pushing down on the two green blocks on the left and the right, I, I could end up, you know, depending on how big the hole is or how small the hole is, I could end up shearing the plate down, okay? I could have a bearing stress failure. I could end up smushing, if you want to look at smushing bearing stress, those two green blocks. And so you have to make sure you're designing, if you have different materials, you have to look at the areas that are involved because I want to punch this, I want to punch through the plate. I want to make a hole in the plate. So I have to make sure that's my first mode of failure, that I'm not failing anywhere else or my system doesn't work. Okay. So it's just a lot to think about. So this, this you can see, it would be the area of that circumference times the thickness of your plate. Um, in concrete, if any of you are construction engineering or civil engineering or anybody that's walked by um, a, a construction company uh, building stuff and you see rebar sticking out everywhere, and you have what's called an embedded link. So if I have a concrete beam, part of the beam design is the strength of the beam. But I also have to say, gosh, that beam is going to be connected to columns. It's going to be connected to columns. And if I don't have a good embedment length of the steel in my beam going into the column, and I load that beam too much, my beam might be super strong. But if I don't have enough development length, it's called a development length that I'm embedding into, What's going to happen? The whole beam is going to just pull out of the, it's the, the beam's going to, the steel's going to pull out of the column and my beam's going to fall down. So it doesn't matter how strong my beam is if I don't have the connection. Connections are super important in case you want to know. Super, 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 super important. Connections are super important. Um, so we have an embedded length. And like I said in concrete design, it's a development length. Okay. Um, but we have to embed, we have to embed the steel far enough into the column that we don't have a failure in the connection area. So if that steel were to pull out, okay, if a steel rod were to pull out of the column, well, what is the area that that we're having the failure? Well, we can see that is an axial force P, right? But the area that's failing is the circumference of that bar times the length of embedment. By, by that embedded length. And that is what I have to resist. So I might have to increase my embedment length to increase the capacity, or maybe I'm gonna have to reconfigure and use more bars, okay? So if I want a shorter embedment length, I'm gonna have to have more bars to increase that, cr that, that cross-sectional area, um, because then it would be that, that area of the bar times the length of the bar bit times five bars. Okay, so I can increase it by increasing my bars, but I may not have room to put five bars in. And that's where the design part is really fun. It's solving a problem. How can I make sure that we are a building something that we that 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 works and that it's functional, but it's not overly, you know, costs too much. It's got to be cost effective. It's not overly designed, um, and I may be very limited by area. Okay, so anyways, so the other thing we want to really quickly talk about is when we, why do we cut things vertically? I keep saying we cut it like a slice of bread. I cut it like a slice, or I could have cheese. I could cut it. Why do I cut it like this? Okay, even when I'm finding that internal normal and internal shear and internal bending moment, why do I cut it straight up and down? I cut it because usually I'm told it's a, it's a two by four. I know the, I know the cross section of the material, right? My loads are usually gravity based loads. If it's weight, um, it's just easy to cut it in my nice XY world. But what happens if I have a bolted connection or I have a weld or I have some sort of anomaly in my material? I have to understand that, that we cut it straight up and down. Okay, We cut it straight up and down because, quite frankly, it's the easiest way to cut it. My cross-section is given. It's going to be given on the plan. I know exactly what it is. My lengths are given. I don't have to think. That stress is N over A. Area is what three by five, two by five, two by eight, whatever my area, cross-sectional area of my beam is. Easy peasy. My stress, super easy to find. Okay, super easy peasy. Because that's just base times height of given. 
okay? Stress block, super easy. But what happens if I have to cut it at an angle? Because if I have a weld or I have some sort of a bolted connection, I have to make sure that I don't have like a pull apart failure of that weld or a shear failure of the weld. Remember, normal just means perpendicular to. So if I have a weld at 30 degrees, like I'm interested in the pull apart part, the third, you know, that normal force or the shear. So I might be given loads in my nice X and Y world, but when I look at this bolted connection at 60 degrees, and I can look between the plates where that thing is bolted together, there's going to be shear in that direction. I have to be able to con convert <laughs> convert my forces into whatever 360 degree world that we actually live in. And so when I cut it at 360 degrees, I can still use statics to find that internal in my nice X world. It's This is great. But once I cut it, my normal always is perpendicular. My shear always is parallel. And when I look at that normal and shear, they don't work in my XY world. They're shifted. They're shifted by whatever theta. So I have to be able to be very comfortable with basic trig, or maybe that's geometry. And I now see that this axial load, that if I cut it like a loaf of bread, just has an internal normal. Once we change the direction of that cut, I have a normal and shear force. And as it, depending on how I cut, it, it's just going to constantly be changing. Okay, it's just going to constantly be changing. And so it's just vectors. All it is is vectors. If I know that I'm cutting it at 15 degrees, then I know that there's a 15 degree triangle in my normal shear and that X component. Um, I also, what happens to my area? Does my area increase or decrease when I cut it on an angle? The width into the paper is the same, but I went from a height of like eight inches. Here's my eight inches. Brink, it's now like a diagonal. So it's actually gotten bigger. So every time you make a cut that's not perfectly perpendicular, your area is constantly changing. So your stress is constantly like evolving as you make those cuts in 360 degrees. So if that was my normal cut up and down, I cut it at 15 degrees. Well, I can now take that internal normal force in my X, Y normal world and I can make a triangle 15 degrees and I can now get my components and I can see my shear component is that internal normal force in my regular, you know, horizontal world and it's going to be opposite sine theta times T and the normal force is going to be cosine theta. When I look at my cross-sectional area, I can see this theta. I know the actual height is eight inches. Maybe it's a two by eight, eight inches. If I know this is at, like I said, 20 degrees or whatever it is I cut, look, I know sine, cosine, cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, I know the angle is 20 degrees because we said it was going to be 20. I know the height is 8 inches because it's a 2 by 8 that I picked up at Lowe's. Well, it's not really 8 inches if it, I picked it up at Lowe's, but pretend. So I can now say that cosine theta equals 8 over hypotenuse, and I can solve for the new length of my area. So it's just a game of trig. That's all it is. Okay. So my area has increased. When I look at that normal stress, that normal stress is now going to be perpendicular and I'm going to have a shear stress. Um, so here's just a, a really easy graphic for you to look at um, to, depending on how you're cut, to figure out what is the new like height of my cross section because it's going to increase and how do I find that normal and shear force. Okay, how do I find that normal and shear force? And because of the way I did my theta, if I'm going from a Y axis, I'm rotating at 20 degrees to make that cut, then I'm going to be going from my X axis and I'm going to be rotating at 20 degrees to get to my normal. So that's what I look at is here's my Y, I've rotated 20 degrees to the right, so my X is rotating 20 degrees to the right and it just helps keep everything in line. And I think that's about it. Um, so is there a stress at every orientation you'd make a cut? Probably so. Is it constantly changing? I mean, look, I went from up and down. I went from no shear to purely, I, purely normal, no shear up and down, right? It's an axial load. It's to, I'm going to have shear. So 
in this orientation, my shear is zero. My normal is probably at the maximum, right? It's the whole magnitude of my vector. As I start to rotate it, it's going to be decreasing this normal and increasing my shear, okay? Decreasing and increasing. So it's kind of cool. We'll get to more circle at the end of the class where we can look at easy ways to rotate and find our maximum values. Um, so anyways, uh, so just, you know, start thinking through things and understanding Shear stress is a tau. Tau means shear. Shear just means parallel to the plane, tangent to the plane. Normal is sigma. It just means perpendicular. That's all we have right now. And then we have stresses, force over area. So I will be putting up the next set of examples. Um, please reach out if you have questions. See ya.